Hi, I'm Derek Ashan. Welcome to The Stream. This is a daily show that talks about the topics you want to talk about. Today, we look at hidden video from inside an Israeli prison and why nothing may become illegal in Belarus. Our digital producer, Ahmed Shahab al -Din, is here looking out for your live feedback, as always. And joining us on the couch today is Dalia Mugahed. She is the executive director of the Abu Dhabi Gallup Center. Dalia, you are a top pollster, and you've been doing some recent work on Muslim Americans. Tell us what you found. We just came out with a really important study because we looked at Muslim Americans 10 years after 9-11. And I think one of the most interesting findings is that Muslim Americans are the most likely religious community in America to reject attacks on civilians, whether it's by a, an individual or by a military. At the same time, though, they are the most critical of the counterterrorism tactics that we've been using, everything from profiling to the invasion of Iraq. And what about the ways in which people are viewing Muslim Americans? Well, it's, it's been kind of a mixed bag. On one hand, we have Jewish Americans very supportive of Muslim Americans mm -hmm. in our study, but Protestant and Catholic Americans were kind of split with a significant minority doubting Muslim American loyalty. This is fascinating. Yeah, it's interesting because we have our own narratives about what you would think. You would think, oh, there's a divide between Jews and Muslims, right. but apparently not the way people would expect. And then uh, this additional information about Protestants and Catholics not maybe questioning the loyalty I think is also fascinating. I think it is, especially considering the last couple of years, some of the loudest voices in the anti-Muslim narrative have mm -hmm. happened to actually be Jewish Americans. It's mm -hmm. just clear from our study that they don't represent the wider community. Okay, well this is good to know and we're really thankful to have you joining us Thank here you. today. It's great to be here. Remember, we always want to know what stories you're following as well, so remember you can pitch them to us in a brief video and tweet them using the hashtag AJStream. Hi, my name is Alec Kweck and I am in Washington, D.C. for um, Refugees Congress and I am in the stream. When activists from the Flytilla campaign landed in Tel Aviv last month, they told Israeli immigration officers they were headed to Bethlehem in the West Bank. That's all it took. They were immediately rounded up and taken to a prison 32 kilometers from the airport. Anticipating this, one of the activists had placed a hidden camera on her person. She recorded moments in the prison and managed to smuggle out the video when she was released a week later. This footage was ultimately turned into a short documentary, uh, which is really quite fascinating, and I think it's worth taking a look at some of their footage. This is from our guest, Dee, who will be joining us just shortly, her experience in an Israeli prison. Let's see if we can get it rolling. We'll take it, actually, directly from YouTube here, if we can. Anything, music, anything that you might have that... Sunglasses, they wouldn't allow us to have sunglasses. Yeah. But they didn't class us as detainees, even though they were deporting us. We weren't actually deportees, so we were in a kind of a other class. That, so what, they were, what he's saying is, you're not in Israel, but we're in Israeli soil in an Israeli prison on an Israeli bed eating Israeli food and being shouted at by Israeli guards and we're told we're not in Israel. Three times a day they had a count which was like half past six in the morning. They would, there was a, a lot of uh, rattling of keys and doors slamming and they would come and you had to Loud. stand up by your bed and of course if you're on the top bunk and usually it was so hot we, we had to put trousers on because a man was coming to count us. But on clothes, I don't know where the they thought coming. we were going to go um, and there was only five, you know, it was, how hard is it to count to five, we were all there. We were mainly locked up apart from being yeah. allowed out for, well they'd say you were allowed out for an hour but after 20 minutes you had okay. to go back in so now, as I mentioned, really joining us via really Skype from Swansea, really Wales, is Dee Murphy, the woman who shot this video. She's also the co-founder of the Swansea Palestine Community Link. Uh, thank you, Dee, for being with us. Welcome to the stream. Thanks. Tell us, Dee, why did you go to Israel? Um, well, I've been to the West Bank twice before, and I really wanted to go back this year. And then I heard about this um, 
a, a French initiative really, Welcome to Palestine, and it was a, a, a combination of the French um, pro-Palestinian people and sort of civil society in Palestine. And they're asking people to come to Palestine this summer, but not lie about why, where we were going. The other times I'd been to the West Bank, I'd lied. I'd gone as a Christian pilgrim. I'm not actually a Christian. So I had to act the part and put on my cross and chain and carry a missile and a Bible and have my itinerary for Nazareth, Jerusalem, Bethlehem. And I, I was really attracted by the idea of going and being truthful. I mean, what could be wrong with that, I thought. Now, let me ask you, do you think that you would receive the same treatment if you'd gone and been truthful at another time, or was this because they were anticipating activists coming for the purpose of uh, basically breaking the, uh, some sense of the barricade or raising awareness about the situation of the Palestinians? No, I, I've known many, many people who've been turned away, detained and deported uh, for just it somehow being found out they've been interrogated for a few hours and it's come out that they actually sympathize with the Palestinian cause and that's it. So really you're not allowed to go and be with Palestinians. You can go and be a tourist, you can go be a backpacker, you, you can go you know many ways but not if you're actually expressing a desire to spend time with your Palestinian friends or just be in Palestine actually you know. It's, now, it's quite shocking. I want to get some comments from our audience, but I want to give you one more question before we draw them in. Um, I did get to watch the footage that you had uh, from your hidden camera, and I understand that the situation was difficult being incarcerated, but, you know, as I was watching it, one of the things that struck me is, well, it doesn't seem so bad. I mean, can you tell us how bad was it? It wasn't so bad. It was a detention center. It used to be a prison. It's now a detention center. And really, it's a, it was five star compared to where Palestinian prisoners are kept. I'd say the only thing we had in common with Palestinian prisoners is that we weren't told why we were detained either. You know, and they're normally detained without uh, given any reason. And it was the same with us. We repeatedly asked, why are we here? What's our crime? What have we done wrong? Please tell us our charge. Nothing. There was, we were just like, no, no questions were answered for us. And that was the, the worst part of it. I mean, yeah, it, it wasn't so bad. I mean, it, I think the shock was just being incarcerated. It was a new experience for most of us. So I'd say all of us probably. Oh. So that was weird. Being locked up was strange. Ahmed? Yeah, Dee, I have a question for you uh, and also many questions coming in online. But we understand you didn't get a deportation hearing. And even though perhaps the conditions weren't horrendous, it's rare that we get insight into, you know, a prison, let alone you snuck in a camera. So how did you sneak in the camera? And also we have a tweet from Daniel FAS1 saying, here's a question, why are we interviewing a flytilla activist when people are dying in Syria, Libya and Somalia? So maybe you can answer, why is it important that you voice your experience and that people understand what uh, Israel's doing to people attempting to travel to Palestine? Well, he's absolutely right. There's so many awful things going on. It's not our plight that was terrible. I think the terrible thing is uh, the West Bank is apparently not under siege, and yet all borders are controlled by Israel, and just peaceful, law-abiding citizens are prevented from going in. I think that's the shocking thing. Um, how I got it in, do you know, I'd really rather not say because maybe someone at another time will want to do the same thing. So that's something I'm keeping to myself. So mm. tell us, the now, and do you feel like, because you were basically held for, I guess, six, seven days, then you were deported, yeah. uh, you were the last of your group to actually uh, go. You chose to stay behind. Why were you, did you choose to stay behind? And what do you think are the implications or yeah. the success or failure of your actions? Mm -hmm. uh, the, I had a very uh, kind of pragmatic reason for staying behind. There was one German woman from Berlin, Angelica. She had a court hearing and, her, and she lost in the court. She, was, um, she lost her deportation hearing. So I just basically stayed in solidarity with her. It didn't feel right that we should all go and leave her. Um, can I say here that there was an amazing American woman in, who traveled with us from Britain, and she's the woman who smuggled the camera out of the prison. And I want to say a really big thank you to Donna Boyd, because I'm, I, I, I felt more vulnerable the longer I was in there and the fewer of us there were. Um, 
in respect of what we achieved, I think many people have been detained before, but it's never really been known. And I don't think many people have been to court and had a hearing. So our Palestinian lawyer told us that now that it's been to the court, there is an opportunity for it to be challenged in the courts. Uh, really, the right for, for vis visitors to enter Palestine. Now, Dalia, so hopefully, go sorry. ahead. What was go. the reaction of people back in Britain when you came back and told them the story? Um, I think people were more concerned for us on a personal level, which is gratifying to a point. But what I really don't want to be lost is, you know, okay, I lost six, six, seven days of freedom. So what? The Palestinians are being detained without um, given any reason. What administrative t detention lasts for six months in horrendous conditions, absolutely horrendous. We were in um, Givon Detention Center in Ramle, in the very same town. There are the most awful Israeli prisons housing children under 18, lots of women prisoners, some with their babies. I mean, this is what we should really be talking about. So let, I don't really want to make a big deal of our experience. However, it was very uh, enlightening and I, See, an unusual I get, experience I get as get well, one so last, I won't forget. I want to get one last question, and if you could answer as briefly as possible. This is coming in from our audience. Yeah, Amuna is asking one question. What's the next step? Do you plan to prosecute Israel or something, and will you return? Well, look, as we all know, Israel gets away with so much. And I think we're just very ordinary individuals, relatively powerless. We'd like to take it. And we've certainly contacted MPs um, on our, uh, you know, asking them to uh, push the uh, British government to put pressure on Israel to allow people to freely enter and say why they're going. Um, I'll find a way to go back. I love Palestine. I've been twice. I'm not going to let this deter me. Thank you, Dee, for joining us in the stream. Thanks very much for having me. Now, you can learn more about this story and others on our Facebook page. You're going to find information there. You can also send us your comments, suggestions, and definitely let us know anything, you else, anything else that you think we should be knowing. A documentary produced by Al Jazeera that highlights the measures the Bahraini government took to quell the Shia-led anti-government protests in the country has ignited a heated debate on social media with most people praising the film. But members of the Bahraini government, including the foreign minister, have criticized Qatar for airing the 50-minute documentary titled Shouting in the Dark, which dubbed itself as a story about the Arab Revolution that was abandoned by the Arabs, forsaken by the West, and forgotten by the world. Now, I'm going to play just a little bit of the video right here. Uh, we're having trouble with the video. Let's see if we can get it to play. Um, so At the end of this talk show, star striker Alaa Hubail and 24 other sports heroes were arrested. <laughs> From television, the witch hunt moved to Facebook. Sites like Together to Unmask the Shia Traitors called on Bahrainis to identify their countrymen for arrest because they went to Pearl Roundabout. So Visitors as you can see, on YouTube in just four days, the video already has almost 200,000 hits. Uh, and using YouTube's analytics, which are open right here, we can tell that the video is most popular, unsurprisingly perhaps, in the GCC, in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Qatar, right here. And you can see that the United States is a quick second. Now, Bahrain's foreign minister, Khaled Al Khalifa, joined the heated debate on Twitter to offer his own critique of the video. Right here, this is the tweet in Arabic. Uh, the translation below, it says, it's clear that in Qatar there are those who don't want anything good for Bahrain, and this film on Al Jazeera English is the best example of this inexplicable hostility. Now, Sultan Al Qasimi, who's a UAE columnist, tweeted, Middle East Online reports on rumors that Bahrain may cut diplomatic ties with Qatar over Al Jazeera's documentary. But Bahrain's foreign minister quickly quelled these rumors, denying any allegations of a severing of ties between the two countries. He tweeted right here in Arabic, saying, the relations between Bahrain and Qatar are stronger and deeper than a damaging television program Whoever does harm to Qatari people is doing harm to his own people. Now, although Al Jazeera staff are currently unofficially banned from entering Bahrain, we here at the stream will continue to follow this story and are planning to cover it again this week. 
So please share photos, videos, and stories you have about Bahrain using the hashtag AJStream so we can include them in the show. And here are some other stories that we've been keeping our eyes on. Opposition activists in Belarus have been coming up with creative ways to protest against Alexander Lukashenko's 17-year-old presidency. Every Wednesday, they gather in cities across the country and begin clapping or setting phone alarms off to go simultaneously. Now, the government is today trying to match the creativity of these silent protests. Ministers have drafted a law that would place a ban on previously agreed actions or non-actions. This would essentially make it legal for authorities to arrest rally participants simply for standing in silence. The draft bill also makes specific references to banning protests organized through the internet. Let's take a look actually at a very, uh, an important site that was uh, shared with us. Um, this is actually, just to give you an idea of the measures the government is taking to try to squash these protests, one of the things they've done is to temporarily block the popular social networking site Vontakti during protests. This is an example of that uh, Von Taki page. It hosts a revolution through social network page. That is a grassroots movement that's been orchestrating these rallies. Joining us now via Skype is Marie Sadovskaya. She is an independent Belarusian journalist. Welcome, Maria, to the stream. Thank you for joining us. Tell us a little bit, has the, uh, effort, have the efforts by the Belarusian government to quell these protests by squashing some of these online sites been impactful? First of all, hello everyone, and I know we're being watched in Belarus as well, so I'll say in Belarusian, Privitania. Um, the efforts of the government to uh, suppress the social network sites were probably not the reason for a little bit less social protests that we've seen in recent months. Most probably, the protests they truly went down, but because it's summer season, because people are tired, and because the organizers have not come up with some creative ideas how to uh, keep the level of participation while the government clamped down on protesters, arresting them, giving them prison terms, giving them high fines, and then also warning them that the new legislation may enter into power. Well, so tell right us now, a little bit about yeah? that. How, how can they arrest people for doing nothing? How can they ban well, doing nothing? Okay, first of all, this is only a bill and it might not get into force the way that it is formulated now. It will be discussed by parliament, by the parliament, by the groups, and it might enter the force in the autumn with some softer formula or with better explanations. What do they mean? Right now, the government is facing a tough uh, choice what to do with those protesters because it cannot use existing regulation to really charge them with um, administrative or uh, charges or giving them uh, days in prison. Now, so we, we before understand, now, Maria. they had to invent something that they you know, cursed or beat someone and the government decided to change it somehow. Maria, we understand that currently there are no opposition members in parliament, so doesn't that increase the likelihood that this will in fact pass? Well, yes and no. If the government would wish to immediately enact this bill, the president in Belarus has a higher legislative authority and force than the, than the parliament, than any law. Mm -hmm. So if the president would want to do so, he would immediately sign a decree. But what they want to do is to see, A, how the society will react to these possible norms, how the international community will react. It might become a part of bargain with the European Union about the sanctions against the Belarusian government so that if they, for example, do not adopt this legislation, it will be seen as a progress and step back to liberalization and so on. Dalia, it seems, I mean, we've talked a lot about these protests in the Arab world, but it seems that Belarus has got a lot of action happening on the ground there as yeah. well. I'm, I'm just really interested. Yeah. Do you think that this was set off or inspired by the Arab Spring? Is, is there almost like a global uprising of young people against governments that they don't agree with? 
Uh, first mass protest actions in Belarus happened uh, first 20 years ago when we dismantled Soviet Union and then after Lukashenko came to power like 15 years ago we had like hundreds of thousands of people in the streets going and demanding the governmental uh, that the government should step down and then af after like 1999 uh, and maybe after 2003, after these orange revolutions, we had some more waves and so on. But in the recent five or six years, I would say, yes, it was more or less passive. And current youngsters probably did not participate in those protests 10 or 15 years ago. So for them, the inspiration surely lies in this Arab Spring events, and especially in the power of social networks, blogging, and all possible web communicators to spread information about potential protests. Well, it's interesting because when we first uh, tweeted out that we were going to be covering this story, we actually saw a significant response online. And that response is we got Twitter spam. Uh, we had all of these accounts sending us a constant thread of stuff uh, and, and we've been wondering what that has to do and some people have been speculating that this is kind of, or some people have told us that that's the response that happens when you argue about some of these issues uh, or you speak out against the government. Now we have been getting some legitimate tweets as well so um, tell us what people have been saying. A lot of people are touching, Maria, on the fact that the international community has not mobilized on either side of this story. And so they're asking, when will the international society start and you know, really support the people of Belarus in their fight against the dictator? But a, a question I have for you is about the actual unemployment situa situation, because we understand that the economy in Belarus is really in the hands of the government. So a lot of people who do work, work through short-term employment contracts. So is there fear? among the people who are unemployed that they don't want to participate in protests perhaps because they fear of retribution from the government. Um, first, first of all, you probably mean the fear of people who are employed and don't want to lose their jobs. Oh yeah, or the, exactly, yeah. correct, yes, forgive me. Okay, okay, so yes and no. Of course there is fear of people to go and protest because they might lose their jobs, but uh, nevertheless the living standards in the, go, in the country go down and the protest potential in the society is raising. The, the problem here is not that the people would not go and protest, they just don't want to go and protest for unknown leaders and unknown goals. Why and are the right people now, protesting, Maria? Sorry? What, is it, what is it that people want? People want better life conditions, more freedom, because they need to earn their back if the government cannot provide them with living standards. That are they calling promised. for Lukashenko to step down? I would say that uh, according to sociological polls, at least half of Belarusians say that they would prefer another president, not because maybe every one of them hates him, but because many people are tired and right now they see that he is not fulfilling his promises. But on the other hand, of course, they are afraid that if the next president or if the next ruler will be, for example, supported by Russia, Belarus can become incorporated into Russian Federation. So there is some reserve of people who really don't know what would be the change because they also don't have access to independent information about possibilities and candidates and oppositional politicians. The state television is banning this information from people. Maria, let me ask you one last question. If you look at my screen quickly, or at least our audience can see it, I have a map that's showing a uh, social media tool, actually, a Google Maps tool, where you can look and see where things are happening on the ground. This is obviously a lot of very wired people are participating, but what about in other parts of the country where people are not as connected? Has this spread, or is this simply in the capital? Well, it is spread by example because people who walk in central squares and see that something's happening there, they start asking. And for example, when I was uh, visiting several such smaller cities, people in the public transport were discussing whether the next social protest action will happen on Wednesday or not. And these people didn't look to me as very tech savvy people. Got so you. I would say it starts from the web, but it goes into the streets and then the streets no, take a notice and uh, break it. Maria, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Now remember, on tomorrow's show, we're going to be getting an update on the victims of Japan's earthquake and the nuclear crisis there, as well as talking about how all companies might be using fake Twitter accounts to sway public opinion. Dahlia, I want to thank you and Ahmed as well. Stay with us because the three of us are going to be joined by a guest from London to talk about the riots happening there during the, hash the conversation using the hashtag AJStream. We will see you at stream.aljazeera.com.
All right, thanks for joining us. We are now on the post show. We're going to be having a conversation about what's happening in London. A lot of people have been tweeting us about this, and we're covering it because you asked us to. So, uh, Dahlia and Ahmed, in a nutshell, we have a really uh, basically three days of, pro of riots that have been going on, and we want to understand a little bit more. So, let's dive right in. In a nutshell, after this weekend, some peaceful demonstrations turned violent. People had gathered in Tottenham to protest against the police shooting of a local man when demonstrators allegedly set a police car on fire. The situation escalated from there, and British police are now examining whether social media sites helped to incite the violence. Joining us now by a phone from Tottenham in London is Arib Ullah, a 19-year-old student who witnessed some of the riots and has been campaigning against austerity cuts to youth services. Thank you, Arib, for joining us in the stream. Tell us a little bit about the cause, or at least the motivation behind the initial peaceful protest. Thanks for having me. Um, the the uh, motivation behind the initial protest was um, a shooting of a young local man called Mark Duggan. Now, there were rumors um, there were rumors that the police shot him point blank. There were other rumors that um, he Mark Duggan himself shot shot the police officers and a bullet was lodged in the police radio. However, and what what happened was a demonstration was organized to actually get some answers because there was no feedback from the police about what was going on, no communication from the um from the between the police and the family as to why their son, their brother, their cousin was shot, their friends were shot. And and this led to this led to um people being upset and um if you if you're in their position you could understand where they're coming from. And they um led a vigil um, between the from the border of farm estate to Tottenham police station. However, sad to say as as the as the protest progressed, for, um, the, you had a hundred protesters in front, and they actually planned to actually hold an hour silent protest in front of the police to give them answers. But what happened was, um, 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 no one was giving them answers, and I think someone just slipped and um, all hell broke loose. And what I would like to say is, and I think I need to make this point very clear: the motivation behind these protests are not because of the death of this one man. These protests are a result of the social conditioning of social austerity cuts. Tottenham is one of the most deprived areas in London, as is Brixton, Hackney, Lewisham, Birmingham, wherever you go. They are arguably the most deprived areas in the UK, if not London. And let me ask so, you one quick question. Is there perceived yeah. to be a rising problem with police brutality? Is it perceived that this is particularly in that region? Or are you saying that you know, the police brutality issue just happened to be a spark to a broader concern? If anything, the death, the death, the death, the death of um, um, Mark Duggan was a catalyst. Um, they ha they have, they, since the 1980s, in the 1985, there was a border farm riot. And during that time, the relations between the police and the black community was really bad. And it was when the riots happened in Border of Farm, that's when the public realised, not just in Border of Farm, but also in Brixton, that's when the, 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 the UK government realised these issues need to be tackled. And since then, relations have improved. I just want to stress that point. They have improved. However, what has happened, there, there's always been this underlying tension between young people and the police. I mean, I put a status on in the morning when I was being interviewed by BBC Radio 5 Live, whether or not there is... And there is a relationship between young people and the police. And some of the responses I got, one, young people feel that the police have a vendetta against them, two, yes, completely, and so forth. So um, to answer your question, I think it was a culmination of many things, and we can't just single out one reason for it. But also another thing that um, could have perhaps sparked even more um, um, answers, that answers, like, answers that need to be answered from the police is the fact that the, the bullet that was lodged in the police radio was, in fact, police-issued. And the gun that was mm -hmm. found on Mark Duggan's possession was actually wrapped in a sock, meaning he did not take it out. So this... Mm -hmm. and, and there needs to be police accountability on uh, this. Adi, I'm going to yeah. ask you a question from Rueda Mustafa, who's been tweeting in to us um, from, I believe, the area there, whether Brixton or Tottenham. Um, she's saying, are yeah. people rioting because of EMA cuts? youth center closures, unemployment, and other issues which you touched on. Um, and the reason I'm asking is because we've seen a flurry of tweets, including one from Saima Mir saying, 
she's covered stories that have been buried by community leaders there that are working with the police to prevent these kinds of riots. So you said this has been bubbling. Do you agree with this, that people are afraid, as she says? Afraid of what, sorry? Afraid of the, the potential for the kind of riots we're seeing now. Have people mm, been I working with the police to prevent these? Well, um, from, from what I understand, and I'm not um, too sure whether or not people are working with the police now, but um, there are. But during when I was there, actually in the um, right, in when the violence erupted in Tottenham on Saturday night, there were youth workers. There were people. Me and like for example, I, me and a few lots of other people were there trying to calm it down, trying to say, what are you going to achieve from looting mm -hmm. these shops? Because the shops that were looted on the high road in Tottenham, they weren't big businesses. They were local businesses. These people were barely living. And I mean, Asda, for example, is a super. Is, I think um, in America it's Walmart, but in in Britain it's Asda. Asda was um, Asda was smashed. Iceland, another supermarket, was smashed. These supermarkets they can replace their goods, whereas some of these shop owners they can't. They have they put, most likely have no insurance. I mean, when I was there on Sunday morning to survey what was left of the Tottenham High Road, there was one man. He was standing in front of his shop and he just fell to his knees and cried. I mean that 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 made me realize, you know what, this is not this is going to take bring Tottenham back ten years. Because you know, Arif, it's so interesting yeah. that you mentioned that very point because uh, we were looking at a, a report. This one is actually coming from the Telegraph in the UK. It's about a blog that was posted by a police officer this morning that's been getting a lot of traction. And I quote: It says the officer, apparently also a former serviceman told of having to restrain a shopkeeper running into a burning building to salvage his stock. Taking off my helmet so I can hear him better, he sobs as he explains to me about his life and how he has built up his trade and now does not know what to do. Um, I'm curious if you could tell us what is happening now. Have things quieted down or what's happening on the ground? Um, on the ground, um, it's quite tense because the police, um, I, got unconf I don't know if these rep reports were confirmed, but unconfirmed reports of... Um, the police actually advising people to um, uh, shopkeepers to close down their shops on all the major high streets in um, in Tottenham and I believe in Wood Green, which is the neighbor neighboring area. And it, it doesn't seem like a Monday morning at all. It seems like a Sunday when everything is shut down, a bank holiday, if you will. So I think, and that's made the situation quite tense. I mean, um, when. When when someone from Al Jazeera stream actually called me, um, we were asked to evacuate the mosque where I was, where I was one of one of the many few that were helping lead the youth group there, because um, there were, there was rumours that rioters were coming to Philip Lane, which is where, near where the mosque is, um, to um, loot the shops and to make sure and to, we had to evacuate the mosque to make sure people were safe, that people weren't going to get caught up in it. So um, and going back to um, Roy de Mustafa's point. I, I I think she is right, and I've been arguing this as have many other people who've been in the media from Tottenham, for example, Simeon Brown, Elizabeth Spears, etc., who who have been saying this this isn't one single event; it's a culmination of events. I mean, like I said before, these 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 riots are happening in deprived areas, not yeah. posh areas like Oxford Street, and there is a sense within, especially within, amongst the people of Tottenham, and I stress this to the police commissioner when I spoke today on radio, that the police, sad to say, it feels like the police let Tottenham burn down. I mean, there's, there's, this, really, there's this picture that's been everywhere that, through the social media of um, a building being burnt, burnt to the ground. And this building was there since 1920. It survived World War II, but it didn't survive the Tottenham rights. Arib, I know that you're a, a fan of Dahlia Mugahed because I saw your tweet earlier and I think she's got a question <laughs> for you. Go ahead, Dahlia. Yeah, go for it. I have, my question is about the looting. Um, there's a, a tweet here from Tom Garo who says, Londoners need to man up, learn from the Egyptians, and form some neighborhood pa patrols. Um, the police doesn't seem to be able to control it. Why aren't the neighbors and the, and the, na and the uh, community getting together yeah. and, and patrolling the neighborhoods? Actually, um, during the Tottenham riots, um, um, there's a mosque on the high road um, and that mosque um, because it's Ramadan as you know they're praying Taraweh, the night prayer mm -hmm. and they and they usually stay there till Fajr, the morning prayer but what happened was because actually opposite the opposite
as it, the mosque, there was a supermarket, Aldi, that was burnt to the ground. People were forced to stay inside. Now, around that mosque, there were lots of businesses, like Somali businesses, hairdressers, etc. And what happened was there were youth that were actually in that masjid, that mosque, sorry, that came that came out to actually like say no stop it what you're doing is wrong and they tried to protect it as much as they possibly can so mm-hmm. so once uh, whoever just tweeted there were people out there trying to stop the looting there were youth workers former youth workers i might add who were who were sacked by by Harangay council as a result of the austerity cuts stop mm-hmm. trying to stop people from actually looting i mean i'm not i can't speak for any other areas but what i can speak for tottenham is that some there were people trying to stop the looting trying to trying to explain to people look at the end of the day this is not going to help tottenham it's already deprived it's already yeah. messed up i, so, I want to ask I mean, you a quick question a couple of things that are coming from our online community are first from liberation 25 saying that it's a shame that the riots washed whitewashed your campaign against uh police brutality hope tottenham mm. uh and achieve closure in this matter and also um this is a quick question from gutmang they're saying the stop and search law is another cause of contempt for police yeah he's saying 100%. that black youth in london can be frisked whenever and are racially profiled is this true yes because um what what happens is hello yeah go ahead yeah, um, that's completely true. I mean, this is something I stressed to the police commissioner this morning when Radio 5 put me through. Um, see the stop and search methods. They have a character profile. Now, this character profile um, um, like gives a very, in my opinion, stereotypical um, description of what a suspicious youth is. So, for example, baggy jeans, um, hoodie, hoodie up, near a cap, etc. You probably have a similar thing in America. I know what happens is you can build like in terms of police relations you can actually like you you can build a relation with the local police officers however when you actually go out of your area these stop and search character profiles are still in place meaning and because you don't really have a relationship with the police officers there the police officers will target you and it was bad a long time ago and it is still pre- prevalent, pre- prevalent to this day. I mean, a similar thing is with the uh, Muslim profiling. I mean, you, you could, uh, the, for example, I know it's very stereotypical and I don't know if this is what the Met Police have, but for example, um, an Asian youth with a beard or a hat or a shaved, shaved Arab, for example. These, these are the kind of, kind of character profiles and gross stereotypes, I might add, that, um, that fuel the anger between yeah. the young people and the police. I mean, this isn't Egypt or Iran where the police aren't held accountable. This is the, the this is the United Kingdom, one of the one of the members of the free world, if you will, or whatever that may mean. Mm-hmm. There, there is there is there needs to be more police accountability. And one thing I would like to um, add as well: mm-hmm. the police have to be accountable in terms of like if you look at past events, like for example, the death of the rapper. Smiley culture, or the death, the death of the. Um, I think the perfect example of the stop and search character profiling go- going wrong is the death of Charles de Menezes, a Brazilian, um, a Brazilian resident living in Tottenham, who was shot by um, undercover police because they thought he was a terrorist because they thought wow. they thought yeah. he he um, um, he suited the profile. Yeah. You can't. The Met Police need to stop making these kind of mistakes. They need to learn from their mistakes. Uh, Arif, you know that saying. Arif, yeah. I want to thank you for joining us. You made some really, really powerful points, and I uh, hope that you will stay safe and hope that the issue of police brutality will be addressed and that these riots will not simply, literally whitewash the core problem. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very much. Take care then. Take, take care. Cheers. I mean, this is like really heavy stuff. We see mm-hmm. drama with police all across the world in the Middle East, particularly these days, but it's happening right there in the UK as well. Yeah, and right here in the United States. I mean, that's uh, one question we asked on our poll is, is it possible to profile a terrorist? Yeah. And more than 90% of Muslim Americans say, no, it's not. Yeah. Uh, but the majority of other faiths say it is. Well, we just did a story talking about how the FBI mm-hmm. and even the NYPD have tried to profile quote-unquote terrorists and virtually everyone we know falls within the profile. You know one last thing that we can say about this story that's different than a lot of other stories we've seen about like police violence is that this apparently was uh, amplified not by Twitter and Facebook as much as by BBM Mm -hmm. which uh, apparently 40 percent of British teens prefer Blackberry to any other phone and 
it's worth mentioning that BlackBerry, which is owned by RIM in Canada, in Canada. is mm -hmm. untraceable, arguably, as yeah. compared to other technologies. And Very and interesting. Well, maybe that's why they don't want them in certain Arab countries. There's yeah. been a lot of controversy around right. that. Dali, thank you so much for being with us. Ahmed, wonderful job, as always. And thank you, our audience, for joining us. Remember, you can be with us in our pre-show tomorrow at 1925 GMT. We can continue this conversation online. Use the hashtag AJStream. We will see you there.